that. I'm going to shoot that directly at Jonas, but I would like each of you mm. to answer. Uh, so um, I think I'm one of those crazy people that uh, enjoy taking responsibility and uh, fighting for things worth fighting for. So I think this is, and I, I, like, I'm tr a true believer in, in European values. Um, I left Apple in the US to take my part in, like, to do my contribution to increase the chances that we'll have a, a seat at the table that we can shape our own destiny. Um, because I think not just for Europe, but for the world in general, um, the next era will be better off if there is more balance of power and if it's not just the US and China um, calling the shots. You mentioned something very important, the European value set. I think we'll hear more of that. Jörg, what about you? Um, yeah, if I wake up uh, with my technology heart in the morning, uh, <laughs> I follow the saying of, of one of my favorite uh, video podcasters, uh, what a time to be alive. Uh, because we're living in a, in a time uh, where you hear there are news and exciting news uh, from the technology perspective every day, yeah, and it's it's even not nearly not possible to digest yesterday's news before uh, today's news are are coming up. Uh, so there, there there are a lot of areas uh, uh, to to look after, to work on, and uh, sometimes I feel a little bit dizzy. Yeah? So where to where to start first? Um, and as Jonas stated already, uh, then the major question is how, how, how can we cope up with it? Yeah? How can we avoid getting in uh, another field of digital unsovereignty and uh, cope also with the challenges on a, on, on a global level and, and, and stay <laughs> sovereign? How are we going to be able to create our own models, our own applications? Um, and uh, respect the European, the European value and, and values and quality systems. Yeah. On this point, I think we are all rather aligned, and I want to draw back on one word that Jonas was saying, balance. So what we, when I'm waking up in the morning, um, now for one year, I'm heavily involved in the AI Act negotiations, and there, my boss and I, um, we are really fighting for this balanced approach, because there is so much anxiety, even yeah, a kind of technology hostile approach uh, within the European Parliament, but in general um, in politics and yeah, just a lot of emotions, ideology and so on. And what we are missing uh, right now also in the AI Act and in the whole AI discussion is to um, really have a clear look on the ground how AI can also improve our life, what are the chances, and so on. So, back to your question, this is really keeping me up at night, but also <laughs> bringing me in the morning back on my desk or in the parliament to uh, fight for a pragmatic and forward-looking and more optimistic approach um, to technology. And also maybe acknowledge that you can regulate too much and maybe you should also allow technology to prosper without trying to regulate every piece. Mm. You're um, saying something very important to strike a balance between what is safeguarding and on the other hand innovation is such a motor and to cut that off would not be so good. However, the AI Act as it is proposed right now doesn't seem to include the idea of founders, startups, all that innovation. It, it, it doesn't seem to have reached the AI Act. <laughs> Instead of that, um, actually, there's a ban on high-risk applications. How does that um, impede um, the competitiveness also in our ecosystem? Should I? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, it's a, it's a good question, and um, I need to start here really at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, for us, and luckily this is really a cross-party um, impression in the European Parliament, the starting point of the Commission is just completely wrong. So um, the idea of um, building a horizontal framework that is applicable to every different sector, to every different use case, is just not possible because AI is already a buzzword. It's including a lot of things. It's including um, um, expert systems that are existing since the Second World War, basically, but also um, newly foundation models, um, deep learning systems, and so on. It's including um, applications in the transport sector, in the um, health sector, and so on. And to 
build horizontal rules that are 100% or literally understood in every of those different use cases is just impossible. And this, I think, is the, the biggest flaw in the Commission's proposal um, that, again, luckily, we in the Parliament, we are now trying to um, fix. Um, hopefully tomorrow, <laughs> I was already asked, tomorrow there will be finally um, the, the text um, that we will vote on, but there, for example, in the new Article 8, we are really addressing now this point, that we are saying those high-risk obligations that are following should not be understood literally, but should take into account um, sectorial legislation, harmonized standards, and so on. Meaning that, for example, if Article 14 on human oversight is speaking about a stop button, mm. the stop button makes sense for some high-risk AI applications, but not for all. Mm. And this, again, is one of the biggest um, improvements, I think, now by the European Parliament. And the second point is also that we um, thought a lot about the value chain and mm. um, how to help European companies to in the end, become fully compliant with the AI Act, because unfortunately the Commission um, focused only on, let's call it, downstream actors, so mm. let's say a Bavarian a startup, mm. that is then completely left alone with becoming compliant. And the big shots, <laughs> for example, Google, that is providing the data set, um, OpenAI, that is providing the foundation model, would be completely um, out of the AI Act. And again, the Bavarian um, startup is being left alone. Mm. This may be just two of the, um, of the main flaws um, of the Commission proposal, which make it extremely difficult to make the AI Act work in practice in the end. Again, we did now, I think, some improvements, but there is still a lot open. And Axel, my boss, and I, we are still not very sure if the AI Act is really a step forward. <laughs> and in the whole AI strategy of the Commission, it included an, ex, um, an um, ecosystem of uh, trust, which mm -hmm. is the AI Act, and the ecosystem of excellence, mm -hmm. which is good. But the second point is completely forgotten. The mm -hmm. AI Act is 82 articles focused on risk and two or three articles focused on innovation. And we think, hopefully, together with industry, civil society, and so on, in the next months, we can make sure that the second pillar mm -hmm. is strengthen and also a little bit more underlined and uh, brought back a little bit in the discussion mm -hmm. and not focusing anymore just on risk, even mm -hmm. though it's important, but it's not the whole story. So we need a more holistic approach. I'm going to take that word risk and ask you, Jonas, what is the exact risk for you right now if you look at the proposal the way it stands now without fixing it yet? Yeah. Um. So the risk is that we're doing what we've done in the past and what we're pretty good at um, is uh, to hesitate and to be risk averse and mm. to uh, do some panels and shake hands and talk about the future. And then a few years down the road, we'll kind of look back and say, oh, well, I mean, why, why didn't we miss this train, right? Um, mm. Wouldn't that be great if we would uh, be able to act and not just to complain, not just to force the US tech providers to put buttons on it, on like, warning, this is an AI that has been trained on this kind of data, or mm -hmm. do you accept all those cookies? Um, I don't think that should be our contribution. So I think this is, and, and this is an excellent example, like the fact that we're sitting here, mm -hmm. because here in this room, there are our AI leaders, the smartest people we have on AI in Germany. Mm -hmm. What do they worry about mm -hmm. compliance? Right? They should be worrying about innovation. They should think about how do we position ourselves and our companies in the next industrial revolution? How do we conquer the world with our great ideas? <laughs> what are they thinking about? How can we be compliant? Yeah. What kind of forms do we have to fill? What are the liabilities? Exactly, right? Yeah. And, and it's not like we have plentiful AI leaders mm. where we can kind of spare a few that can worry about regulation. I mean, we are catching up to the US anyway. Mm. Mm. So I think that's the risk not only for us, we can only survive if we are part of a strong ecosystem. We can, the strategy that Microsoft is doing, like monopolize everything, that is of course not a strategy for Aleph Alpha. Uh, our strategy has to be collaborative. Our strategy only works if we can empower government and enterprises to um, build a strong position themselves. 
then we can also survive. If, if that fails, we by ourselves, impossible. What do you see as a strong ecosystem? What does that mean for you? Uh, creating, creating value. Mm -hmm. um, like we've, we've got some of the like, best companies in, in Europe as partners, and mm -hmm. I think they ha have a tremendous opportunity. They have unique data, they have uh, deep knowledge, and they can use all that and build new products or build new, kind of build new markets, build new categories. And they're starting to do that, but the question is, is it going to be fast enough? Because we are now seeing that, and this is like a global consensus, this is the market of the future, there's tremendous potential, everyone wants to win. And if the US wants to win, they're, they're getting out their checkbook. And they're throwing, and, and money, they're at throwing money at it. It's like, they, yes. okay, we want to win, that's 30 billion, right? Mm. And this is like, 20 billion is just open AI. The internal cost, every, every enterprise we're talking with tell us that the uh, Microsoft sales team was already there <laughs> selling open AI, and as they should, right? Mm. That is completely legitimate behavior. Mm. We should be doing the same. Mm. Jörg, how do you see this entire development? Because you were the, the founding member of um, the German AI Association. You've been passionate about AI for a long time. How do you see this view? Um, first of all, I fully agree to what has been said so far. And uh, uh, coming back to, to your first question, mm. when, when I uh, heard for the first time about there will be an AI regulation, I asked myself, so, so what for? Yeah, so there are many regulations in, in, in regards to uh, safety relevant uh, products and and all other uh, kinds of, of applications and products that potentially could harm people and and uh, so why don't we focus on this and extend uh, uh, the uh, the application of AI into these products huh? um, the first version of the uh, the first proposal of uh, the uh, uh, the Commission uh, was at least well structured, yeah. So we were focusing on on uh, uh, on applications, yeah, an application view uh, and uh, classification into risk levels. Uh, but when I first read about uh, uh, from the uh, council proposal that general purpose AI will be considered as high risk in general, I mm. hardly could believe this. Mm. Uh, because this is in contrary to the first proposal, to the overall idea, and it's simply not practical. Mm. Uh, uh, um, and uh, I asked myself, why don't we do this uh, like, in, uh, like in, 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 in any other areas, that if you build a high-risk system, uh, uh, then you have to make sure that the underlying foundation model that you're using has some kind of certification or follows okay. the rules of the overall AI. This would be so easy mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's practiced since, since tens of years in, in, in the market for other areas. Um, because you, you never, if you, if you build a foundation model, you, you never know who is going to use it for what purpose. Yeah? Especially when it comes uh, also to, to open source initiatives mm -hmm. or to startups. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you cannot think about all potential usages and, and applications, and, um, uh, and, and, and it will be a huge burden yeah? to, to follow these rules and to, to apply all uh, the obligatory uh, processes that, uh, that you have to do. And this will, from my point of view, be a burden for the whole uh, AI ecosystem in, in Germany and, and Europe, which could be easily uh, um, made, set up in a different way. Yeah? And we have to be more flexible and really more specific uh, on, on these types of, of, of questions. And the development is so fast that you have uh, in the future, we, there, there will be threats and, and potential harms that we don't foresee right mm. now, even in the regulation. Mm. Yeah? So if, if, the, if, if these potential harms occur, we cannot wait another four years to have another regulation. Yeah? So we have to have a framework to react quickly. Mm. And it could be done, for example, what I think is, is more, more or less logical is that there should be some, uh, uh, some rule to mark artificially generated artifacts like, uh, like text, chatbots mm. or, or images as artificially generated. Mm -hmm. And this is somehow already done in, in, for example, in Norway, where there is a law that uh, e even manually uh, photoshopped uh, images from people in, in, in social media have to be declared yeah, to, mm -hmm. to avoid uh, misinterpretations in kinds of beauty uh, mm -hmm. uh, ideals for, for younger people. So this is, this is easy, this could easily be done, and I, I think this is the way we should uh, handle this. 
Now, both, all, all three of you agree also that one of the most important things for Europe will be a European value set and a strong ecosystem. Now, Jörg, I know you have two projects. LIM is one of them. How can that help with uh, strengthening our ecosystem? Um, yeah, so the w one project is really uh, uh, bringing uh, in some ideas or, or comments uh, t in, in regards to the to the the, the AI Act, uh, and the other one is is more fun, yeah, <laughs> which is uh, uh, thinking about what 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 can we do in, or, in order to cope up with uh, the U.S. and and and, and China, yeah, because uh, we have the talent, yeah, and we have the data, yeah, and. The, the very best example is what, what Jonas is doing with, with Aleph Alpha. Uh, but we are not bold enough. Yeah? We don't have the money uh, uh, as, as, for example, Microsoft and the other gi big uh, uh, internet giants have. Um, and, and therefore, we have to, uh, to cooperate yeah, in all areas. Uh, the um, competition is not within Germany or not within Europe. The competition is overseas. Mm. Uh, and that is, that is exa exactly uh, the goal of, of the project that we set up with large European AI models to, to build a platform to, uh, that provides, on one hand, the uh, expensive compute power yeah, mm -hmm. to uh, research institutions, to startups, but also to the industry, and uh, to build a catalyzation, uh, crystallization point in order to uh, be a center of these ecosystems mm -hmm. and that we each help if each other, support each other, uh, so that we are uh, not, uh, um, that we can face the, the, the wave of, of uh, applications and, and uh, AI that is coming from overseas. So one thing is um, the infrastructure as well. What about um, Jonas? Um, how does your company need to deal with the future and this competition? How can you position yourself in Europe to um, make this way forward? So we've um, started building language models even before GPT-3 was mm -hmm. out in 19. One of the first things we built was a very similar to GPT-2 type model that was speaking like uh, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, that was quite fun. Um, <laughs> And we invented multimodality two years before now mm -hmm. GPT-4 has it. We now are the first team that has explainability. Mm -hmm. And so we can pro provide safe and audit-proof uh, results. And that's giving us a lot of traction in critical industries like health, legal, mm -hmm. finance, um, government, security. Um, so I think we're well positioned, but the, what I worry about is that we won't be able to move fast enough mm -hmm. uh, because we don't have the advantage of calling Daddy Microsoft uh, to kind of <laughs> pay for like a massive acceleration. We basically have to bootstrap. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're a venture fund. Uh, we have some incredible investors that kind of realize the potential of this technology also pretty early. Um, but the, the real bottleneck is the um, adaption, like the work of partner, with partners. Mm -hmm. and they kind of, this is what will um, enable for the founding rounds, this will enable everything, right? Mm -hmm. If we can apply the technology fast enough, um, and this can only be done through partnerships, and of course, uh, public um, administration is a, a big puzzle piece here for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, just the kind of the speed. So, so what I worry about most is, are we gonna be fast enough? Mm -hmm. And what I think is the kind of the bottleneck there is not necessarily the availability of compute that helps as well, um, but also the courage and the, the partners and the ability to move fast, which is not necessarily a German discipline. Um, <laughs> so I think that any, anything we can, we can do to uh, accelerate and uh, instill some courage yeah. into our AI leaders would be helpful. I got that message. <laughs> um, I actually think that our environment is changing. Um, I'll tell of a project that we just um, started also in, in Berlin called the Testing Experimentation Facility Health, which with the TÜV for the first time um, shortened the certification so that AI um, applications and innovative projects can be brought onto the market faster. So I think we actually are making the moves. As you said, we just need to get more fast or more courageous about it. What would give, what do you think would give players the more, more courage? What do they need? Do they need the backing from, from the EU? Or is it finding other partners who think like 
like are like-minded in, in in Europe, or how do you think one? Well, reg regulation certainly uh, is not helping, um, mm -hmm. right? Because it is um, in introducing uncertainty, and it is um, focusing our creative energy on things that are not necessarily value driving. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's yeah, certainly it's not helping. Um, I like your ex uh, example on um, what are we actually doing here? Like, are we are regulating fun fun foundational technology mm -hmm. because it might be used for something that we don't like, mm -hmm. uh, which is to me something like it's, it's almost like at the invention of the computer, we would say, oh, look at that computer. That's pretty complex, right? Nobody really understands what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And you could write a nasty email with that, or you could like look at an evil website. So let's regulate all computing. And now if you want to build like a, a watch with a computer, with a calculator on it, that mm -hmm. all fa falls under the compute, computation, general computation regulation, mm -hmm. uh, which maybe is like a little bit hyperbole, but it, I don't think it's too much off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hi, back to you. You said um, you work very much with um, positioning the idea of trust also yeah. in the regulation. How do you go about that? Because I think this is where Europe can really make its mark. I think our brand here should be about trusted AI. How do yeah. you see that? How can we fix um, something that the regulation that is coming now so that it includes that, so that we are actually on our path to creating that brand? Yeah. So this is actually, in the European Union, one of the uh, biggest point uh, behind the AI Act, or the biggest mm -hmm. motive, that they really want to create um, a second Brussels effect. Mm -hmm. So um, after the GDPR, mm -hmm. which they <laughs> see a little bit as the golden boy of European legislation, mm -hmm. um, and maybe and now I'm getting already a little bit negative, not seeing things that didn't um, go so well with mm -hmm. the GDPR. Um, and yeah, I think you, we should really learn from the mistakes, especially when it's about enforcement, about um, legal uncertainty uh, with the GDPR and so on. But also, and now going back to your question, focus on uh, things that work well. So for example, in general, even though I'm not supporting all principles in Article 5 uh, mm. of the GDPR, but maybe it's a good idea to have some general principles uh, mm. for AI systems, like uh, yeah, you were talking about trustworthiness mm. or transparency, for yeah. example. In general, I think human oversight makes sense or unbiased data sets and so on. So mm. I think if you manage to, to have some guiding principles, um, it could really work if we manage to make them enforceable and also, yeah. let's say, logical on the ground, um, going a little bit uh, back to my first point. And I think a lot will depend on good harmonized standards, mm -hmm. on good guidance, and also fast guidance, not like with the GDPR, where we waited for years or even until now. I think the certification now. just happened exactly. at the beginning of this year. <laughs> exactly. So this we definitely need to avoid. And this is, I would say, one of the biggest uh, potential bottlenecks mm -hmm. uh, with the AI Act. Even if we as Parliament and the Council are fixing most of the problems, it's really all depending on good enforcement. But mm -hmm. if, we, if we manage all of that, I truly believe that, um, that it could create a competitive edge. Um, like you are saying, we could then maybe sell it as trustworthy AI mm -hmm. made in Europe, and mm -hmm. people know that then certain safeguards are implemented, are in place, and so on. Um, and yeah, then maybe we will be able to catch up with uh, US players and mm -hmm. so on. Um, but again, it's, it really depends on a lot of details and especially on um, the enforcement. We need to have legal certainty mm -hmm. and I would completely agree with my uh, co-panelists that right now there mm -hmm. is not a lot of legal certainty and I would also be afraid that we actually cause the opposite, a lot of legal uncertainty and this mm -hmm. combined with what Jonas was saying, with the lack of um, investments. Mm. Just one example, there is an AI lighthouse, mm. which has a budget of 800,000 euros. Mm. For, and this is the, the key EU project. 
even a shiny city is investing, I don't know, 10 times as much <laughs> and so on. And yeah. if, we, if we are trying to compete worldwide with such low investments, mm -hmm. we will never make it. And uh, Jonas was also making those examples of OpenAI. They are getting so much funding, and I guess mm -hmm. a company like Aleph Alpha probably if they are going to a city, will often be confronted with a lot of skepticism mm -hmm. and uh, fear and mm -hmm. so on. So despite all of that that we are talking about, we really need a change of our mentality okay. and um, be more bold, like uh, Jörg was saying, and mm -hmm. really try out and, again, make really use of this technology. Yeah. I would like to open up the floor for questions from our audience, if there are some. There's one at the back. Thank you. So <clears throat> thanks for the interesting discussions. My name is Christian Goodman. Um, so I'm just wanting to say, you know, regulation, if it's imprecise and ambiguous, it's probably um, um, a bigger problem. I think it's inevitable to have regulation. But maybe my question, I'm not quite sure if trustworthy AI, like AI made in Europe, is an actual uh, selling point to other countries. Uh, you know, why would they, would they buy uh, a European or German AI made ethical AI, let's say, why would that be interesting for them? Maybe you could expand. Um, no, I'm happy to, because I'm selling to the US currently. Um, because they worry, they, I mean, we don't have to, that's like always a little bit odd to me, that uh, lawmakers are trying to force us to do things that, and, that at the same time make sense, right? <laughs> so, um, like, I don't know, like, this is going to be too expensive, so we outlaw it, right? If it's going to be too expensive, nobody's going to do it, right? And um, we are working with some of the world's biggest banks, and of course they care about the trustworthiness, of course they care about um, if they want to use AI, that it's going to be trustworthy and it's going to be correct and it's going to be like the human-machine collaboration is set up in a way that it empowers their experts and not opens them up to risk and they want, they want to have it auditable. And I think this is, I like, I, without any regulation, I would have built the same piece of software. And it's not European. They're not working with us because they know our address is in Heidelberg. They're working with us because our mission is to bring sovereignty to the enterprise, to bring safety and, and trustworthiness, in, in, like, build this into our stack. So for, for me, and of course, maybe like, European helps the brand in a sense, right? Like, uh, there's this German company, and of course, they're going to focus on enterprise grade, robust, safe, and explainable AI, naturally so, while kind of everybody else is kind of doing the playful B2C stuff. Maybe that helps the brand. But I think overall, um, that's just what we're good at. Um, I think German companies are very good at these complex processes, at manufacturing, at things that require um, a lot of care. Um, but it's not necessarily that we have to be forced to do that. No. Maybe to complement also, um, there is, for example, or there are several U.S. companies, one um, in New Jersey, I think, that is basically building on the GDPR, using it to um, yeah, build up a competitive edge, and it's they are really, really growing, 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 because in the United States, apparently, it's a selling point to say we are following and are fully um, compliant with the GDPR, at least to those parts that make sense. So, again, if we, if we construct the AI Act in the end in a, in a good way, I would completely agree that it, uh, yeah, it could become a selling point. And with the GDPR and a few other legislation out there, we see or we see empirical data that it's indeed um, working. But mm. it needs to be done in a good way. Mm. So you are right. Maybe if I just quickly extend, I mean, I guess the question was a bit towards um, the values that other countries have and other cultures. I think Hans elaborated on a couple of points in the morning. Uh, and then it might just be incompatible, right, when you have systems that are giving answers which are not necessarily in line with the uh, values of that country or that culture, right? So then it doesn't really gel, this sort of uh, argument that you have this type of, let's say, European valued AI, right? It may just be incompatible. It's a bit different to GDPR, perhaps. Mm. Well, I'll leave it there. maybe, maybe uh, double-clicking on that. I, 
in, in that we do have like somewhat of a different design philosophy as I don't think that I sh we should be building an art system that is outputting the world as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically um, enforcing our, I don't know, like ethics, chief ethics ideas <laughs> on what the world should look like onto all our customers. Um, and maybe we're kind of a little bit off the hook here because we're not building B2C systems. I know that for B2C systems, responsibility is slightly different, but um, our, our customers and partners are the world's best enterprises, and they can take damn good care of that themselves. And so we're focusing on transparency and control rather than shifting the output of our model to some odd or like them, some ideal output that we feel is, is kind of uh, represents our values the best. Yeah. And as, as Hans stated, uh, in regards to also these, these ethical questions, there are many areas when you follow this route, at least you will have to answer who is going to decide what the truth is. Mm. Yeah? And, and this, is a, this is not an AI question, <laughs> this is a, a general very complex question, uh, but we, which in, within these discussions somehow right now is transferred into the AI sector and mm. the AI is guilty for, for uh, being unethical or, or causing mm. problems, but the, the real problem is on a different side. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe it's the courage of Europe to address these questions and to actually also um, include them when we make the laws. But we don't want to put hardship onto our startups so that they have the liabilities or they, they have um, added compliance. We still want that innovation. There's a question. Is there one more yeah. question? Joanna. <laughs> Please. We have three. We have exactly two minutes and fifty-eight seconds. Okay, so William Times, so she has a question. I, I, I'm, I'm confused about what to ask because I feel like you guys are are kind of uh, having both sides of the cake or something. You know, mm. uh, the I strongly agree that um, the GD. So I'll, I'll tell a quick GDPR story. Mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of work with Google um, for pro bono for some reason uh, on their on their policy and ethics <laughs> in, in when when the GDPR was coming in, mm -hmm. and they were all saying, "Oh, by the way, we're pulling out of Europe when it comes in." They, they just walked up and tried to tell influencers mm -hmm. complete mm -hmm. BS. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and then, but I continued working with them, as you may know, this ADAC thing that happened later. Anyway. They, after the GDPR came in, not only did they not, they not pull out, but six months later, they're like, this is great. This is like an API mm -hmm. to 28 countries. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it, the EU is a trade block. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I was so angry that you guys are saying, oh, you're not thinking about the, you know, everyone is thinking about SMEs. That is core mm -hmm. to EU values. Mm -hmm. Trust me, I've been in a lot of meetings about the AI Act and everyone has always mentioned that. Mm -hmm. They've always mentioned the, the positives and the negatives of GDPR, right? Mm -hmm. We have been thinking about all these things. And so a lot of what you guys are saying is great. And I agree what the, what the council tried to introduce with the you know, generative AI is nuts, right? There's this late minute shoehorning mm -hmm. that could disrupt the whole thing. Don't play into the hands of the American companies that are again trying to disrupt something that will probably help them as well as us, mm -hmm. right? That just don't do these talking points and don't undermine our process do contribute to it, but don't just make weird critiques. So was there a question? <laughs> <laughs> you, guys, you guys can come uh, harass me at my keynote later. I'm, I am talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Maybe. Are there any more questions? I think so, here. We're I, becoming I, engaged. I love this. Yeah. Let's go. I, I want to be very quick. Also for Kai, uh, right? Because uh, I have to thinking about uh, GDPR and also the AI Act uh, for a long time, right? Mm. I want to provide uh, very pragmatic uh, solutions <laughs> for EU. I think uh, GDPR gives many companies uh, the excuse, mm. also government, not do AI data-driven approach. Therefore, mm. I think on the one hand, define the regulation on the paper, but I think it's very important EU provide also toolings, mm. standards for mm. person uh, identify <coughs> Uh, personal data and also provide methods to uh, data privacy. Don't only deliver regulation, also deliver tooling standards. And then every company say, this is the current standard technology which the world can achieve. We can only do as far as we can data pr uh, protection because mm. technology are not there. But we don't have the excuse, no, don't have the excuse. Don't do innovation. Mm. I think this 
EU, also for EU Act, right? I think mm. about it. Only risk-driven classification mm. is too simple-minded. Mm. If you go to your kitchen, you study the devices, most of them are high risk. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, under which condition you are allowed to use your knife? Mm. If you don't use your knife, you will not have food, right? Mm. This, this is also, don't make the things too simple, right? Mm. I think it's very complex because it defines the future of our society. Mm. Not only one dimension risk, also mm. potential, under mm. which condition this use case can contribute to the uh, innovation of the society. Yeah. This is my proposal. <laughs> Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> if you still have time, I can. Can you? If you still have time, I would like yeah. to give yeah. the panel the chance to <laughs> now respond to your question. <laughs> yeah, very quickly. Um, so. I think we are completely aligned and um, my boss and I, we are really trying to, to push for that. We are all the time underlining, again, what I said, AI is a buzzword. Uh, you need to consider that there are a lot of different use cases. Not everything uh, should be banned or is a big threat to hum humanity. There are a lot of um, uh, positive um, opportunities and so on. So this we are really pushing. And also the, the SME point in the parliament, yes, everyone is talking about it, but there are often some ideas. For example, there's now a fundamental rights impact assessment brought in by, um, by the Greens and Social Democrats and so on. I understand where they are coming from. They really want to focus on the deployment of a high-risk AI system, and maybe to some extent it makes sense. But there are things in it, like you need to make a public consultation before you are deploying an AI system. If this now every German or European <laughs> company needs to do, no one will use AI because it's too expensive, it's too burdensome and so on. So this actually, when we are talking, we want to help SMEs and startups. We need to make sure that we are not um, yeah, putting in certain things that will definitely um, unable them to, to use AI and so on. But um, the point that you were also, or both of you were making, again, enforcement will be a key point, and definitely we need guidance, we yeah. need also the national competent authorities, or now they are called national supervisory authorities, mm -hmm. to really be there prepared and have guidelines, have common interpretations, not differences between Bulgarian, Belgium, Germany, and again, have a fragmented um, internal market. If we manage that, I'm not 100% sure. I really hope we are learning from the GDPR mistakes, because otherwise, and now this you both mentioned, we again strengthen um, Google, Microsoft, and co, because they have the means, the financial resources, the um, human resources to be compliant after six months. Even mm. if they are not compliant, they pay the fine, no problem. Mm. But a German startup will struggle. And in the end, if they are facing the risk of paying, I don't know, now after the parliament, 7% of their global income um, <laughs> as a fine, mm. they will yeah. think about, hmm, there are no standards, there are no guidance, mm. there is no clear um, interpretation of uh, those 10 keywords. Mm. No, AI is too risky, I will mm. not invest. And then we have again a situation that we are making big tech even stronger and are kind of achieving the opposite of what we want to achieve with the AI Act, because it will, we will fully depend on US and um, uh, yeah, non-European companies uh, when it comes to AI, and we will be basically just the end user of those <laughs> final products. This would be a terrible outcome, so I really yeah. hope that <laughs> together we yeah. can <laughs> avoid that. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have a run out of time. Um, I still want to offer Jonas or Jürgen the, the possibility to answer if you still want to add something to what Kai said. No, I, I agree with everything. I just maybe wanted to add that um, I agree that it's not just about complaining. And uh, although I may seem to have complained a lot on this panel, this is not the only thing I do to uh, help <laughs> out the uh, European regulation. <laughs> <laughs> the, same, the, the, the same for us when entering into discussions. Uh, we mostly we come also up with alternative uh, suggestions. Yeah, how how could we do it better? Uh, and I think one one thing in, in the discussion is, is frequently missing is. Uh, 
the complexity uh, and 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 the uh, the gray area yeah mm. the uh, it's it's really hard to to define what really is meant yeah mm. and and i often enter into a discussion where i say if if you if if if, if this article is 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 uh, defined this way you can't do x Hmm. Yeah, and uh, the counterpart says, no, that's, we don't mean this, yeah? we, hmm. our motivation is a different one, a good one. I say, yes, I understand your motion, motivation, it, it is good, but if you read it really uh, word by word, hmm. you have this gray area and a CEO or a VC who wants to invest hmm. uh, or is responsible for these types of applications and wants to avoid risk, he doesn't get into this. Hmm. And, and this is, is, is one, 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 one major construction issue yeah that we are trying to regulate something that isn't clear yet mm -hmm. and we have this extremely large gray area yeah a gray area of opportunity though i hope <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately we need to um, finish our panel discussion today i want to thank you for your valuable insights I take with me that we need to lean forward more, engage more, be positive about it and grab it and uh, form it to what we think we need in Europe. Thank you so much. Thank also you. to my audience. <laughs>